Good afternoon. It's nice to be here and sharing, you know, what ancient text, Indian textiles, what science and technology lay behind it. We all are very much appreciative of, uh, you know, our beauty of our textiles, the aesthetics and the comfort of it. Uh, we have on display a Banarsi brocade, which is of course of contemporary vintage, but its ancestors are in ancient India. So we will explore, so in these two lectures of today, um, what we will be doing is essentially look at our own textile heritage, what it was and how the science and technology behind it has carried on and that has made India famous, whether it was the dyes which, you know, natural dyes which are permanent, fast and lustrous, which made Indian dyers masters of the world. They were the master dyers of the world. And there was a time when India clothed the world, not very long, at least 17th century uh, of common era. This is a contemporary patola. I'm beginning with our own Gujarat. I'll be showing you contemporary slides of, uh, you know, today's uh, interpretation of old motifs. This is a typical Hamsa motif. This is woven by Rohit and Rahul Salvi. And uh, we'll go on, we'll understand more about uh, its dyes and its loom, the science and technology behind it as we go along today and tomorrow. But our next few slides are uh, contemporary interpretations of older design motifs done today using natural dyes, using similar science and technology, right? Uh, so we will look at uh, these which are world famous and are still enduring to this day, Indian uh, textile traditions. Today what we will do is we'll have a broad overview and we'll also lay the scientific foundations, focusing on the looms, focusing on, you know, important traditions and so on. Tomorrow what we will do is we'll look at specific uh, textile traditions. And I will, there will be a surprise tomorrow, we'll, we'll be having more samples where they can be examined and so on. Because without the tactility, without touching and feeling, which is what made Indian textiles, for us comfortable to wear and you know for others across the world comfortable wear it's important to touch and feel them and to understand physically to see the science and technology this is a typical uh, you know indigo and madder dyed uh, patola piece it's a sari it's a section of a sari using traditional motifs but a contemporary version again uh, of rohit and rahul salvi elephants were an important motif popular across both in uh, Gujarat as well as in Southeast Asia where these patolas were exported. This is again looking at the pan motif, pan bhat motif. Now before we move on, I do not want to do a very blind, you know, just begin, uh, you know, giving you the list of science and technologies that are there. It's important to see a textile. How do we see a textile? You have it hanging uh, on display before you. How do you look at it? So. Uh, I will not be just showing the samples, but I will be actually uh, showing you how to see, how to understand, okay? So embedded in this textile are numerous sets of science and technology traditions. We will be identifying numerous sets of science and technology by uh, deconstructing a textile material. I will show you what we mean by deconstructing. Uh, physically, the socio-economic, cultural, and political aspects overlay these basic aspects. The basis of a textile is its fiber, whether it is cotton, silk, bast, linen, hemp, wool, etc. Indian cotton is shock staple. Now, cultivation of the Indian cotton is a complex science and technology process. So we begin from there, the seed with the raw material itself. Now, upon harvesting, its processing is another set of science and technology, such as ginning and spinning. Spinning requires tools, such as takli, for wool, where from the ball of uh, the mass of the fiber, you extract the thread. It is done by hand traditionally. And for wool, you will have shepherds in the Himalayas, you know, and even in the plains, having a takli, you know, they'll have the ball of uh, this wool, and they'll be spinning with their I mean, in their hands, and, and it will be down on a spin. The takli is the... Um, instrument, a uh, metal, uh, a wooden uh, rod with a base at the bottom where the thread then wounds itself round and round that. 
we do have, uh, so that is an important science and technology. Very simple, but most effective. And for cotton, we have the well-known Ambar Charka, again, which is done by hand. With Ambar Charka, we had 400 counts cotton muslins that were produced. So diaphanous that, you know, people really coveted it. Now, another set of science and technology is the creation of the warp and weft. What is a warp and a weft? If you uh, know the, the graph, you have the x-axis. The x-axis is the warp. The y-axis is the weft. In Hindi, the x-axis is, or the warp is called as tana, and in the y-axis or the weft is called as bana. This is, now if you were to apply mathematics, you know, there is a specific length of cloth of a certain dimension and of a certain space. So it's very mathematical, actually, if you have come to look at it. So another set of science and technology is the creation of warp and weft threads, setting of the loom. The loom is another set of science and technology. Weaving is another. When we uh, go on to the other uh, slides, we'll, I'll show you how it is. On loom embellishment, that is while weaving, you embellish. Like on this particular textile, you have those booties. You have all those designs. That is done on the loom. That is a technical term. What you can use zari, you can cotton thread, silk, peacock feathers also. And uh, off loom, once a fabric is woven and taken off, if you do any uh, embellishment to it, again, whether it is embroidery or zardozi, like today that you're doing, or uh, block printing or painting, that is called as on off loom or post loom embellishment. Again, each of those, depending upon what you decide to do, you have numerous science and technology sets that are associated with that. What we also have is a dimension of aesthetics, designs, and motifs. Designing with motifs is another science and technology that takes into consideration the calculation of space for each element. They are fixed. There is an X amount of space only. So if you're going to put a motif there, and you have to calculate at what space, how much of space it will occupy, and you have to figure it out in that given space of the textile, of the rectangular piece of cloth. Over and above, you have the socio cultural, economic, and political aspects that are embedded in the textile. Who wears these? Who produces this? Is it uh, uh, you know, commissioned by the royals to give as gift? More force was needed. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, we look at key concepts: uh, appropriate science and technology, decentralized sci science and technology, and in the hands of people. Appropriate is used here in the sense of what is exactly necessary. Uh, with the science, technology, skill sets, et cetera, to create a product. Uh, appropriate science is continued and sustained focus, scientific inquiry, codification, and passing uh, down or transmission it across generations and regions. It is with regard to tools, looms, agriculture, making of dyes, dyeing processes, yarn preparation, weaving embellishment, post-weaving, cloth finishing process, calendaring, burnishing, 
etc. Perfuming. Perfuming is very important, etc. Technology is property technology is technology per se and tools such as looms, though and also tools of dye making and so on and so forth. With respect to textiles, it has always been appropriate. Science and technology in the Indian context has always been appropriate. And we'll see this especially when we look at the, whether it is the dyes or whether it is, uh, you know, specific looms that have created specific kinds of products. Now, we have scientists. Who are the scientists? It is the people, the producers themselves, or the scientists and technologists who innovate and uh, who adapt. And, and this is a very decentralized process which is alive and vibrant and in the hands of people. We do not have either a scientific terminology or technical terminology or manuals, you know, written manuals. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. So therefore, oral tradition, and there is a way of looking at it in there. It is all science and technology, but it is done in a different way. That is about it. So uh, it is very vibrant, creative, and innovative. Now we'll have a, this particular section, we'll have a look at our textile heritage from prehistoric India, that is Bhimbetka, rock shelters. These are the, K, these K paintings indicate that, you know, some amount of clothing was worn. Uh, if you were to see, if you were to see, these are, uh, these images, I'm sorry for them, but uh, this is the best that were available. You see them wearing, especially here, it shows that they are wearing, uh, especially around the waist, uh, a band or a girdle of a kind where they're hanging their weapons. You also have this woman here carrying a baby. This kind of a depiction with triangles in an inverted and a straight triangle shows that it is a, uh, that some kind of clothing was worn. If you, See this particular thing, you have this dagger or a sword which is flying hung from the waist of the um, warrior. Please note this particular, uh, you know, shield and a sword. A much more clearer depiction that has come is here. You can see the breast bands, crisscrossing breast bands here, and you can see the lower part is clothed because it is patterned. So it is with this. You see this breast bands crisscrossing. This is uh, because these uh, paintings are very old and very often, you know, the color has eroded. So uh, this is the best that you know that we can have. So this is the earliest depiction in Indian culture of uh, clothing, which is Bhimbetka uh, rock shelters. We come to the Saraswati Indus Valley civilization. We have this priest. He is wearing an uh, could you just circulate the bust? All of you, please, uh, you know, uh, pass it around and see I, while I'll talk, and it can come back. Uh, this, this is the bust of a priest. He's wearing an upper garment that we might call a shawl, which is patterned in the trefoil motif. That is three-leaf pattern motif. The pattern there is termed as a trefoil motif. Uh, scholars are divided whether it is uh, embroidered, printed, or a metal disc ha that has been attached to the cloth because they say there are three holes of each leaf. So why do you have three holes? That is because of, uh, unless something is attached, you make a hole and you attach. But this is where uh, we are. But that shows that you know there was patterning of a certain kind. Even if metal disc was attached, we know that off looms, uh, embellishment was very much there. A single cotton thread was discovered which is dyed red with madder. So which shows that not only that cotton was woven, but also that natural dye madder did exist at that time. We also found bronze needles, spindles, parts of loom that were discovered in this vast region. Okay. Now it is likely that given this vast geographic region and it's spread over time, that uh, this kind of uh, technology and culture of textiles was also widespread, had also would have likely to migrate to other regions, maybe like Haryana, present day Haryana, like Rakhigarh and so on. And from there it could have gone elsewhere. There was extensive trade with the West, with Persia, Mesopotamia, 
uh, and Persian Gulf and Western India. So uh, what it is possible that some innovations could have technology could have come from there and from here and they were all incorporated. Cotton was grown, it's a cotton growing region, so cotton was also woven in that region. Typically in the Indian context, wherever you have cotton that is growing, you will have cotton weaving in the nearby regions, whether it is Deccan or anywhere else, or even Northeast, wild cotton is also harvested there. Uh, I'll go briefly just to show that Vedic, uh, you know, that uh, the basis of our uh, textile health science and technology was, was there, laid much earlier. Vedic and post-Vedic period, 1200 to 600 before common era and 600 to 323 before common era respectively. In the Vedic era, Indo-Aryans from Iran had migrated and they would have brought in with them their textile technology. That is one aspect that we need to keep in mind. In the post-Vedic period, uh, the sources are literary uh, sources like Brahmanas and Upanishads. Now, Buddha and Mahavira were born, Greek writer. At that time, we had, uh, you know, uh, hemp and rushes, bast fiber, clothing that was made. And uh, here we have Herodotus who mentions that natives, especially in the Khamba, that region, wore clothes made of rushes and that Indian mercenaries and Persian armies wore cotton cloths. The fibers were cotton, fine and coarse, rushes, linen, wool, silk and, and hemp. Uh, dyes were indigo, yellow, crimson, magenta, black turmeric. Bleaching of the cloth was perfected. Clothes were decorated with borders of cutwork and embroidery, which is called as katikinara. Garments were both uncut and sewn. Buttons were made of bone, conch shell, yarn, gold, and silver. Needles were made of quills of hens or fine bamboo thimble scissors. All these are the ancestors of the succeeding centuries textile traditions. We find that in the succeeding eras, uh, there is a continued practice of these traditions. We come to now the Mauryan and Shunga periods, 321 to 72 BC. This is the map that shows you the extent of uh, uh, this particular civilization. Uh, robes were embroidered in gold thread, according to Strabo. There were flowered muslins that were embroidered with jewels. So th it all reflects that there's a higher degree of not simple embroidery with, uh, you know, silken threads or cotton threads, but imagine jewels that were being embroidered. Now, of course, there's extensive trade and uh, both the sea as well as land, and large caravans were also traveled. Now, textile weaving had become a department of the state, so they were superintendent of a particular department who supervised the state production of cloth, both fine and uh, you know, coarse. Uh, they were, of course, all kinds of uh, fabrics are commonly available. Material similar to kimkhab, that is interweaving of silk with gold and silver wires and beautiful flowing patterns were exported long before Mauryas. Kimkhab is basically, uh, a, earlier everything was cotton, silk came in much later. Kimkhab is that you have a cotton warp, the x axis is cotton, the y axis is one thread is cotton and the second thread is uh, zari, gold or silver, that is kimkhab, okay? Uh, Tomorrow I'll show you a sample piece of what I mean by kinkha. Uh, so just imagine in cotton, all this is done back then. Now fine transparent muslins embroidered with purple and gold like the later material shabnam, morning dew. This is shabnam is in medieval uh, time, but its ancestor was there much earlier. So we have similar colors, the four primary colors that were used and this set continues across uh, empires and ages, red from safflower and madder. This was used until very recently, until stocks exhaust, got exhausted and you know, it became very uh, expensive to uh, dye with these uh, natural colors. Blue from indigo, uh, the communities who were doing, washermen were also dyers and they were called as rajakas. We'll find this particular community of washers down the ages they have continued the profession, but they have also, also uh, you know, uh, expanded a little more of their work. She is wearing her Uttariya, is a head cloth, that is Odhani that you'll call now. She is wearing 
it is patterned. You see this lower cloth also is patterned. Here she's her upper garment, a blouse or choli you can call that too is patterned. We are not able to determine exactly uh, what kind of the nature of patterning it was, perhaps a block print or perhaps, uh, you know, woven, we do have no idea, but patterning existed. This too, if you can see, uh, his lower garment, it's all patterned. And very intricately, you know, very fine cloth that is now uh, folded in such fashion. <coughs> the Satwana Empire is in uh, the Deccan and uh, uh, both coarse and fine cotton was woven. Similar set of dyes, it all continues. Vast fiber, that is hemp, very cheap material made of hemp was worn by weavers and laborers of all kinds. Washermen, same their role has continued. Printed it, same it had continued. The bride's silk garment had the motives of swans, a couple, that is my Mithuna, on the border that were printed in Gorochana, which is a yellow pigment dye that was used for making the tilak for her garment. Uttariya, that is upper garment, cloth, often of silk was embroidered with flowers and birds. Again, precious stones were embroidered on the borders. Uh, fabrics woven in patterns and printed, used as utility items and for clothing and for floor covering were used back then, they were used in the earlier era, and today also we are using them. It's the same template. These are the village women, and these are the, uh, you can see the patterning, you can see the way, uh, it's a very transparent blouse that she's wearing, and she's wearing a short dhoti kind of a, a garment, which is tucked in, so is she, which is reaching to the ankles. These are the men, common men, uh, you can see the patterns on the garments. These have been actually reconstructed by literary sources and by sculptures and available paintings. You see Buddha, Buddha's uh, cloth has a border, a thick border. So thick borders, you have the way that it is draped like this and it falls in a certain way. You know, the fall, how the cloth drapes on uh, the body and how it falls, they have all perfected that. The Kushan Empire had a similar template of that of the Satvahana. We had the motifs uh, like bands, stripes, flowers, stems, and leaves, and a herringbone design, lions, bees, sheep, birds, and geese. This template has come to this day. There was also patchwork, and you know where you have stiffening of uh, you know coarse cotton linen, uh, where this padding and this uh, felting. These are all actually made for uh, foreign uh, people, soldiers, or you know, uh, people of royal uh, court who had, who were there in the, the courts. She is wearing a lovely. She is wearing a lower garment uh, worn in the kacha style. A mekhla ties it all together. It's an external accessory which uh, holds it. She is wearing a tunic. You, it's all ruched. You can see her ruched and you have these beautiful buttons here. She, her uttariya is just casually flung on her shoulders like today's ordhani that, you know, people will fling themselves on their shoulders. The Gupta Empire, again, uh, early 4th and 8th century common era. Finer, by this time, finest textiles were being uh, printed, painted and dyed and they were available. There was considerable improvement in the art of calico printing. There's origin, these are the origin of many traditional prints of today and there's a continuing of the same template. Uh, so embroidery of muslims, a wider repertoire of designs uh, was present. Similarly, intricately woven brocades and brocades of floral designs from Deccan and Patan were similar to today's brocades. Dhaka gauze was so fine and transparent that only its delicate gold edging indicated, uh, indicated that the cloth existed. Embroidery reached its highest peak in the north and northwest. You see her, she's sitting. Her lower garment is patterned. Her upper garment, Uttariya, it's so transparent and yet it is patterned. She is wearing a tunic 
a choli of uh, tie and dye, which is called as Pulak Bandha. This is Kimkha. This is a, this is a contemporary piece. Uh, Kimkha, you can see very little of the base fabric, but you see more of the gold. This base fabric is, sil uh, is silk, but back then we used to have it in cotton. We, I mentioned Dhaka gauze was so fine and that only the existence of its border indicated that a cloth existed. If this border didn't exist, you won't know that a cloth is draped on the body of a woman. This is actually from a little later period, 10th, 12th century AD of Khajuraho. Same you'll find here, again at the border. Such sheer, fine, wonderful cloth is woven on those rooms in those days. Today we associate, you know, such fine weaving with, you know, mills and, you know, that kind of a technology. But these were woven in those looms of those days. We have no account of the specific looms or the names or any, um, you know, description of them. But by these depictions and by the descriptions, we're able to uncover. So dyeing has become uh, very sophisticated. Uh, like I mentioned, Gujarat and Rajasthan's dyeing is known as Pulakabandha. Everything is subsequent eras only perfect what was done in the earlier eras. Indian muslins were exported. Egyptian mummies were wrapped in Indian muslins. Uh, washermen's community continued to do the same. Silk weavers became very wealthy and they were the main donors to the temples. If you see, this is also tie and dye. This is Pulakabandha, which is Rajasthan, Gujarat. This particular garment, again, all heavily patterned. Look at the way that this is fallen. So the fabric is also treated in a certain way. This is the embroidery that you have. This is the embroidery all over. This is a very interesting uh, piece of garment. This is called as Gajajin. He is an ascetic. He is wearing a yoga patta. This is a yoga patta, but his garment is made of strips of bark that are stitched together. These vertical lines indicate that this, these are bark strips which have been joined together. Medieval India is basically a culmination of whatever science and technology was there. All those continued. There was also further innovation, uh, but where uh, external influences came, especially Mughal and Chinese through trade were incorporated. So there were wider repertoire designs and Persian influence, this is where we looked at the royal aspect which is embedded, the political aspect. Because the Sultanates and uh, the subsequent Mughal era, they had links with Central Asia and Persia that those influences also came in. Like, for example, the draw loom, Persian draw loom was brought in. Similarly, the draw loom and the Nakshabandhi of bulk of Bukhara came in over, of course, a larger period of time. La Royal Karkhanas that produced Khilat material. Khilat is the uh, gold, the Kimkha robes that the uh, Sultan gifted to his nobles and people who he felt deserved. Either his own clothes, that was the highest achievement, uh, his own discarded clothes that he gave, or else, freshly made clothes were there. You had royal karkhanas who were who had no other work except to make these expensive things, you know, uh, that were needed. This is a Persian shikargar. This particular, this is a contemporary piece woven in Varanasi, but this is a, is known as shikargar, and its template came from Persia. This is a Deccan Golconda, where we have our Kalamkari, which is a modern tin resist hand painted uh, art. Uh, this was Golconda and it was done around Machli Patnam. This is 17th century common era. This too is part of that. This, if you notice, all these are Persian themes. There is a very strong connect to the Persian miniature paintings. The stories that they narrate. Now, after the medieval period to pre-colonial India, that is late 19th century common era, India had clothed the world. Indians were the master dyers. The fame of Indian textiles from ancient times only grew from strength to strength. 
Now this brought in of course uh, Europeans who wanted to buy spices and also the textiles. And along with the trading interests, they developed political stakes. I'm just summing up very quickly. And then uh, after the, you know, then uh, Europeans developed political stakes, established their own strongholds. And after the 1857 revolt, India became a colony of the British, like that. And it meant the destruction of Indian textiles and mill-made products from Britain came in. And everybody knows the impact, devastating impact it had on Indian textile traditions. Now, as a result, the independence struggle focused on the strength of Indian handloom textile traditions. This is a piece that was actually commissioned by the British for their own home consumption. This is done in the chins, Kalamkari style of Machli Patnam. This is the skirt of a lady. And uh, you can see in the border, you have scenes of their life in India. So this was something exotic. And a lady wearing this back in England would be depicting our life in the colony back there. We have numerous scenes like this in numerous pieces. We come to the loom, the major uh, science and technology bit uh, for textiles. Uh, we will not begin with the classification of looms as primitive, sophisticated, and so on. Instead, we're going to see the looms, what they essentially are, you know, that they are appropriate functional technology, innovated by communities to create clothing and utility items for themselves that are in themselves sustainable and through a sustainable technology. Whether a basic mobile loom creates the thick and low count cotton dhoti, or through the naksha bandhi process, a baluchari sari is created, it is only appropriate technology necessary to create a specific kind of textile for a specific use. There are different kinds of loom, tana, the tribal loom of Jharkhand, draw loom, pit loom, frame loom, loin loom, patola slant loom, korovai, adai, kuppadam, jala, getwa, jakad. These, is, these are only a small representation of the various looms that have existed in our country and still continue to exist. But sadly, we find that the documentation of our looms in different regions has been really been MS. Uh, only a fraction of them have been documented. We have our uh, textile surveys, weaver surveys, which is regularly done by Government of India. But uh, looms do not form. What kind of looms, in what region, is it, what kind of productivity it is having, we do not have any state, uh, you know, uh, data on that. Nothing, no information. We find that the current trend is that these pit looms, etc., are replacing many indigenous looms. We look at the Central Indian tribal beefs, that is Odisha, Koraput, Chhattisgarh, Bastar, those are uh, adjoining areas, Jharkhand, Ranchi district. These are small mobile looms weaving short width clothing. Again, you will call as appropriate basic looms. Today, modern looms are replacing them. Weaving communities, both tribal and non-tribal, you have Panika, Mahanto, Meher, Chik, Badaik, Tanti, Swansi, Momin, etc. Tribal communities across the region are the com consumers. The threads that are commonly used are the low count cotton, that is, they are the coarse. The material will be very thick, not fine. And originally it was locally grown cotton and silk, that is, wild tusser silk. We'll have a look at, uh, this is a Jharkhand loan. This is a traditional loom, it's a mobile loom. It is called as Tana, okay? If you, this is a mobile loom, all that the weaver does is, he'll dismantle the poles. Here, he'll dismantle them. This is what is stabilizing the loom. You have the, this is the beam, the bar, the warp bar. The warp thread is stretched taut across and it is stabilized by stakes that are dug on the ground. He sits and he, this enables him. The warp is called as tani. This enables him to, you see this at the back, the red extra weft patterning. This leaves his hands free to lift the warp threads. He's lifting the warp threads and is inserting the weft thread of the red color, so that patterning is enabled. This has been, uh, this is the cheapest and most effective instrument for local use. 
the weaver will take his loom wherever there is requirement. He will uh, put his loom under an open tree because there is enough light and he can stretch the, you know, the loom appropriately instead of working in homes. The consumers will come and tell him that this is what we want and he does it right there, weaves it in a week or 10 days and then he gives it to them. Uh, so how effective it is in terms of its design and in terms of its functionality. You cannot have a pit loom being transported like this, that mobility and of catering to the needs of, you know, of the people. This is made available. This is how it was and to this day, this is still in practice to, in some regions. Then we have uh, a tribal Chhattisgarh Odisha loom. Again, these are indigenous small rooms. Today, you have modern looms. Again, low count, thick cotton, three shuttle looms. Uh, unfortunately, this loom has practically disappeared. That is, there is not a single image of this loom. Today, we have only modern looms. And that has happened because in order to keep it for tradition alive, government of India and Odisha intervened and they wanted, they made the weavers create products for urban markets. Now, if urban markets will not wear the short sari, you know, short width sari, so then the regular standard width sari of this nature began to be woven by using modern looms. So now only basically modern looms are there, which can also weave the traditional clothing. So their traditional clothing continues to be produced as and when required. The patola loom is a, this is a patola loom. It is at a slant of 30 degree. If you recall the images that I had okay, shown right in the beginning, this is at a slant of a 30 degree. This does double a cut and it is a most complicated weaving, not the only one. There are others also in the most complicated uh, category of weaving. This is where patterning is done on the yarn through resistant modern methods and the both warp and weft. If only uh, either warp or weft are done, then it is single cut and it is relatively easier to weave. But if you are doing it on both the threads, both x-axis and the y-axis, it gets difficult because while patterning your calculation has to be perfect. If you misstep, if you miss out anything, your work is ruined. Either in terms of you have to calculate the threads, the distance, and then it is tied, the areas that needed to be protected from dyeing have to be tied with earlier with cotton thread. Today you have rubber strips that are being used, but effective equally. And then you tie it and you retie it. And then so that is a you have limited number of colors when you have this kind of a ikat dye. Then once you do your warp, then you have to do for the weft. Now, if there is any miscalculation of the weft, it will not align properly with the design and the already done on the warp. So, that particular tie dyeing ha patterning has to be done correctly. Second area of concern would be that of when you're weaving. When you're weaving, both the warp and the weft design has to sit perfectly like this. We do find little fuzzy and, you know, out of synchronized, you know, sync you have or designs, which means that the weaver has made mistakes. So this is the most, that is why this is considered as magical. It was, it went to Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and these were heirlooms. Indians have used and discarded their patolas and others, but in Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, it also led to the development of their own double ikat by having these. We are in the museums that we have today, we have those pieces in Australia and so on museums. We have only one family that is actually doing this uh, patola weaving in the traditional way, that is a Salvi's in Patan. Chotelal Salvi, he is still doing his and his sons are still doing in this way. Northeast India, this is another uh, loin loom, which is also called as a body tension loom. If you notice, its width is small. And you see at the back, width is small. It is supported at the back by this particular band, which goes round. So this is the tension that is provided is with the body. 
the tension for the warp that is provided is typically of the two beams, you know, warp beam and the breast beam that you have. But here it is provided by the body. That is why it is called as body tension room. So the warp threads remain uh, straight and taut with the right tension. Now the clothing of this, it is woven in strips. This is very common in Northeast India. This is one kind of a loom. The other loom, which we use Jamdani, is in Manipur, which is a frame loom. Then you have in Assam loom, a regular home loom, where the clothing of the family is woven by the women. It's only women who weave. Men don't weave. This is a typical uh, a shawl from Northeast. So a typical shawl has three pieces that are joined. Here, this is a join. And here, this is a join. This is a join here, a close-up of the join. So three strips are attached. They're woven separately because the width is narrow. Then to make a wider width, they attach those strips. We come to the brocades. This is, a, like I said, it's a continuing ancient tradition. Base fibers, cotton for a very long time. Today, silk is more recent. This sari is a brocade. And it is a wedding sari. Now, we have uh, typical, when you speak of supplementary weft, here you have supplementary weft adorning. That is, the normal cloth is both warp and weft, it is woven. But when you want to put in a design, then you bring in additional second weft thread. And you lift the warp threads, and then you, attach, you put in the, uh, the second weft thread. That is called a supplementary weft weaving. It is discontinuous because uh, every time you want to put in a buta or a design, you will insert fresh weft thread and do it. This is discontinuous. Where there's an innovation here, and which I will uh, show you tomorrow, but this is the basic, you know, when you speak of weft design. Now, different kinds of looms, when you speak of a, a weft or this kind of a brocade, different looms are used. In Ahmedabad, we had Asavali saris, Yadech, you know, different kinds of uh, brocade and different kinds of looms. Ahmedabad, Asavali saris, and so on. We had looms like Ghoda, Khada, Shal. And Gatwa, there's a theory that the Gatwa or the Gatwa loom migrated from uh, Ahmedabad to Varanasi when the weavers went here. Then you had Pathan, Deccan. This is an ancient site of cotton brocade production, trade item to Rome, bridal dress of Roman brides, and it was a long waiting time. Then you had Kanchipuram, South India. Varanasi silk brocade is a recent introduction of 18th century, but it was known for its cotton brocade. Please remember it was cotton all along. Silk came in different points in different regions. Silk, that or mulberry silk. Now multiple looms are used. Now we have the Gethwa loom, which is Namavali garments woven according to the client's measurements on the loom. Uh, we had Jala and present day Jakar. Nakshabant is one who draws a picture. Technique came from Balkan, Central Asia there. Three shuttle looms, body, border, and pallu, all three are woven separately and attached, known as Korova in Tamil Nadu, Koppadam in Gadwal, and Ada in Andhra Pradesh in Tamil Nadu. So you have Kimkha, Amru, Brocade. This is the bridal cloth. I'll give you some pictures. Look at the way that you know it is done. It's rich silk, and you have this design at the bottom against a backdrop of Zari. This kind of a patterning in color is called as enameling. You have, this is all enameling. Where in a background of gold or uh, of zari, whether gold or uh, silver, you have colored threads which go and highlight a particular motif. That is called as an enameling effect. It's a similar situation here, but here you have some bela straight. Like this, we had uh, this particular design and frame that Palla was made actually as the Jama 
in four in royal karkhanas four meters cloth was woven for the jama or the upper robe of the uh, royals this is a very complicated weave called as lampas where we until now we spoke of a single warp and a single weft then we spoke of a second weft for uh, doing those buttas and you know supple patterning now you have this where you have multiple warps and multiple wefts it's dense weaving where you know threads at the back you won't be loose threads you will not find them this is the lampas it this is actually a curtain this is uh, again it was produced in royal karkhanas and it is now being produced rather very rarely there is a private workshop few places that is all this is again you have uh, brocade again this is a, a yardage for men's garments this too is a yardage for men's garments but you see this is like a the motifs it is like a mat a chatai weave you know design that you have how difficult it is so subtle that very often you have to it's not they are not loud like this is a very loud and a, you know striking piece and it is meant to be like that but when you see these brocades especially for men they are very very subtle this too is another piece you see the motifs you see the small enabling the buttas that you have this is again another brocade it is a recent vintage using natural dyes earlier i had mentioned lions as part of the design repertoire you have lions now baluchari uh, draw loom with jala for figurative design now woven in bishnupur on jacquard uh, handlooms pattern was very well known you had roman brides waiting for uh, these brocade cloths to come in from pattern so that they could wear them and uh, get married now with this what we have is this here pitlom is counter uh, balanced double interlocking tapestry weave style migrated to chanderi because again here we look at the political when marathas ruled wherever their empire stretched this particular weaving technology and the design repertoire went and where all it went it went to armur in mehboobnagar telangana varanasi ahmedabad gevla nagpur burhanpur central india pune chanderi tanchoi there is one brocade which is came from outside from china three brothers came from china and they brought in brocade where it is only silk uh, and silk in terms of density and complexity it is very much like our uh, you know uh, kimkhab and brocades this is a patni this particular design repertoire it has traveled wherever the maratha empire had spread the weavers went and this design repertoire went this is a banarasi pitlu me jala attachment uh, the jala is this the jala is you know when you have for simple weft patterning you don't need jala you don't need any additional attachment to the loom the moment you have more complicated designs like the line that we showed then a figure is you have to draw the figure you have to set up an additional attachment whereby you, the figure that you have on your graph is translated onto the paper which requires that the warp threads are lifted in a certain way in a systematic and when you have a long and a complicated drawing then it has to be uh, an additional requirement is needed and that is jala the others also this is a jala you see the small boat or sword that they call the weaver every time you have to do it that there is a cross beam here two weavers have to one two people have to sit the weaver sits here and another guy sits here above him he has to be a little above the weaver because he has to see what the weaver is doing so the weaver will insert something and then he will lift the guy who is sitting in front and above this is a beam he will lift he the warp threads so he will take this and he will lock it there you know where then the weaver the who is doing the weaving he will then finalize it imagine how many times you have to keep on doing 
so it's very laborious and very you know a time consuming this is a jala you can see a little more clearly here okay this is how they what they do is they there is a jala frame and then they set the jala they said this is a jala frame it's a wooden frame where the uh, drawing that you have is transferred onto this and this then is transferred to the loom to the loom like this it looks like jala means spider's web this exactly looks like that but it will lift that specific set of warp thread so that the weft thread can pass through underground this is a frame now you have the adai loom which is a little similar to this adai is used in uh, andhra and karnataka uh, sorry not karnataka in uh, tamil nadu we come to brocade banaras gyasar gyasar is woven on banarasi pit loom with jala attachment but now it is woven with jacquard system attached to the loom jacquard is much faster it is used this is you must have seen it uh, very often whenever tibetans they'll have these huge monasteries you know they have these huge gyasar things they sometimes the robes are also made of gyasar very much priced today they are getting the main supplier is again from varanasi indians are doing it this is a gyasar brocade loom you see this arrangement jala here you have the gathwa loom it is now extinct only uh, somebody has revived it in varanasi and he has worn a big piece of cloth of more than a meter or so uh, this gathwa loom did the most intricate asawali sarees are also made on uh, you know fandabad are also made on the gathwa loom now we had the namavali cloths this is a namavali upper garment for men where you have uh, the names of the deity repeated multiple times you have cloths woven you also have garments this gathwa loom was weaving pattern like you have the sample cut you know they'll take the measurement of the client now according to that measurement of the client they will draw the pattern i mean that like the tailor makes the pattern and cuts it similarly here that pattern is drawn and then this design is made and then that only that is woven on the loom this is made possible only in on the gathwa loom and the reason this was done was because when you wear these holy names you should they should be complete they should not be cut or anything so to prevent that this particular uh, you know technology or technique was utilized i am showing the image of you know this is a part of an uncut cloth you see the you know the feet holy feet and so on but can you imagine that you know the pattern cloth is woven the design is woven on it it is very interesting kashmir shawls uh these are pashmina shawls and we have they gave to the world the paisley motif most wanted item by the western royalty and so on this is a persian rollo like i said earlier that we have brought in looms we have brought in innovation we have brought in design repertoire we have only grown and we have incorporated it and we have only enriched it not diminished it and this particular came from the uh, from persia including the designs and this is uh, a persian rollum and the nakshaband also came from bulk bukhara so nakshaband is a person naksha is map nakshaband is a person who draws the map the design uh, is drawn by the master and he is known as a nakshaband if he concept is to do with the conceptualization once he does the conceptualization then you have its implementation in different stages the kashmiri kani loom is a single uh, is a, is a short width loom like our loin loom uh, that we found that it is a um, short width loom and 
the shawl is woven in strips and then it is joined by skilled embroiderers called as rafugars. Now this is a ta twill tapestry double interlocking mechanism. This is the loom. The weaver will sit here and this is the loom. It's a short width loom. Because of the complexity, you will, you will not be able to make out a joint. So just think of how many, uh, you know, nakshas that the nakshaband would have to make. Because it will be woven on different looms. And what kind of a coordination is required so that there are no flaws? You know, some that all weave perfectly and in synchronization so that when the pieces are joined together, it is a complete whole. There are no visible flaws. Now I'll just quickly run through other, um, you know, kinds of looms that we have. This is a Navalgund Guddha short width loom. This is for, for uh, this is for floor covering with a wart face, and they also makes uh, rectangle boxes. Now Parsi is where Kushti. They tie it as a holy sacred thread, which is tied around your waist as a protector. They have Sudre, which is a pocket of goodness where it is put. So they wear a vest, and there's a small pocket there. Now this Kushti is woven on this particular loom. It is woven by the women. They brought this loom with them and it has remained with them. Others do not weave, make this kushti, but they make it. So some have remained with them. Unlike, uh, you know, you had a tanchoi, it went out from the Chinese tanchoi brothers and it, others are doing it. So it's an interesting tapestry. This is a khan loom. Khan is the blouse that I'm wearing. This is there in Maharashtra and Karnataka, where these are, this is again a narrow width loom, where again you have complicated weaves, so it is woven only, this particular uh, item is woven on this. This is the Khan loom. This is a Gadwa loom with Jala. Now you can see, this is a Pit loom with Jala. You can see these boats that I showed you earlier. You can see one, two, three. You need two people to do this. This is my last slide. I'm ending with an off-loom, post-loom embellishment. Uh, this is um, actually the Parsi embroidery. Okay. How much time we have? We are done? We have time. How many more minutes? Okay. Uh, I would like to, uh, before this, I just wanted to have a check with you. Is there anything in this presentation you want me to elaborate? Yeah, I, I know about different varieties of beads, different types of beads. Uh, what is the difference between beads? Weaves, yeah. uh, such as? Okay, tomorrow I'll handle those. Yeah, I'll handle those tomorrow. I have brought samples. So tomorrow I'll with samples, otherwise it just becomes too theoretical. So, you know, we'll uh, handle it tomorrow. Uh, but anything else, weaves will be done tomorrow with samples. Yes. Hemp was, uh, see, past fiber clothing was used both common and for specific needs and for people. Ascetics were allowed to wear bast fiber clothing. That uh, gajajan that I showed you was a bark strip. So it was like dukula tree in, uh, you have in Bengal. Uh, we do not know any more details about it, but this particular bast fiber tree, you had strips taken out. Now, ba so we have of barks. Then we have that are made of grass, like rushes that, you know, Strabo mentioned, right? Uh, so you use that. Then you also have a, today, hemp is used. It is used, in fact, until recently in the Himalayas. They knew how to use it, how to handle it. They knew all this. So hemp clothing was there, very much there. So they knew how to soften the fibers. They knew how to ret it. They knew how to soften the fibers, and therefore they could weave it. This technology was there even in the Satavahana period, when the weavers wove, 
and a cheap kind of a cloth. See, unless the cloth is suitable for wearing, only then people will wear. Otherwise, if it is rough and itchy and, you know, uh, really difficult to wear, then you have problems. It will not be in use. But it has continued over time, means that the biggest challenge of bast fibers is their softness and their wearability. This for different products, whether it is the bark of a tree or whether you have hemp and you have other rushes, you know, water-based uh, grass, people had perfected across regions and over time. Today, we are having, you see the challenge, uh, that today we are using the same, especially of, uh, you know, of this, uh, not the bark uh, strips, but other uh, bast fibers, we are using rayon process. Banana stems are taken and then they are uh, put through the rayon process of chemicals and whatever have you, and then a pulp is extracted and then you have chinalampattu, you know, these that are coming out. Today you're having sacred, these are called as sacred cloths, uh, useful for ritual use, for puja and, you know, those kinds of purposes, where you're having this kind of a modern science and technology. Whereas we did have an extensive, different bast fiber fiber softening technology that had existed much, much earlier. Does it? Yeah, it does. So there are in ancient India, you have, I think, Lalanji Gopal has done and Moti Chandra have also written a lot about, you know, all these, these in great detail. They have looked at, uh, you know, Amar Kosha, where Amar Kosha is a Sanskrit dictionary. And uh, they have identified which part. There is a confusion, like for example, Dukula is mentioned is subsequently or late, you know, for different products. But Lalanji Gupal makes it very clear this is from, you know, Bengal and this tree and so on. Roshan Alkazi has also, you know, mentioned. Even uh, she mentioned is Bhang tree that you have even in, and Moti Chandra also and Lalanji Gopal, all three have mentioned that in Himachal Pradesh, in the Himalayas, that uh, they was, clothing was still made in a limited quantity even in 1950s. Many of these traditions that have come from over ages, similar science and technology, that is a very interesting part that you find. What little description that you find in the ancient texts, we find that similar kind of a technology was used even till 1950s and that these were available. But now, because of a lot of factors, uh, change in lifestyle, intrusion of external economy and, you know, developmental factors that a lot of people are kind of letting go. And this is not uh, just with hemp, you know, bast fibers itself because it is very good. Today, we have a reinvention of the wheel. We are looking at sustainable fibers, fibers of the future. But at the same time, what we already have has, much of it has been let go. You see? There is a problem. Whether you have a Northeast, whether you have the Apatani, whether you have the Monpas, that you have that, uh, you know, bast fiber jacket and so on, they were used. Maybe it's some more, some less, but there was a widespread technology which is in the hands of people. And they were self sufficient. What my uh, present lecture today shows is that in, from ancient India, we were self sufficient. There were science and technology, multiple sciences and technologies that were in the hands of people. And that was not just only sufficient to meet their requirements, whether daily wear coarse or whether fine wear for the rich and for export and so on, but they had surplus too. And that this was so widespread that each region is really self-sufficient, each area. And it is a vibrant science and technology that got it through. This is a key aspect. Today, when the Britishers came, actually when they came in, they didn't understand. When they tried to deconstruct, because their gold and silver was being drained into India, that uh, they wanted to understand the so-called technical processes of, say, for example, dyeing. Dyeing, they broke their heads. Europeans broke their heads. Because when they sat and they tried to work it out with Machli Patnam dyers, these painters and so on, they couldn't figure it out. They were looking at, they were looking at from their view, world view of grams and ounces and this particular step and that. They had two different ways of science looking at, you know, science and technology, you know, how ways of looking at it. That is about it. Measurement, you know, like they didn't work. Even today, 
In fact, if you speak with Pastri of uh, you know, Ajrak, he was mentioning that uh, when pe people were asking from the UK in a workshop as to how much exactly this should be done, and this is recent, a few years ago. He said, uh, I won't be able to tell you, but I will do it and I'll show it to you. But they wanted it in grams. And they said, how do you know that when is it that this is actually ready? So he said, yeah, you know, we, that mixture, we taste it. So naturally, it was difficult for the British to understand this kind of uh, you know, way of looking. But it was perfect. It works. And it has been working. So for textiles especially, if when we are looking at our Indian textiles, we need a more open, a broad-minded mind way of looking. We have to understand what, from their point of view, understand how they saw. It is also, we also speak of, uh, you know, looms. Typically, when we speak of looms, we look at, uh, you know, in terms of simple to most complicated, most sophisticated, that there is a linear progression from simple to the most, which is actually not really the appropriate way of looking at it. So that is why I just said a basic loom. I didn't say a simple loom. I said a basic loom. I mean, basic means uh, what is appropriate. To do a complicated, figured, you know, with uh, another miniature painting, Baluchari Sari, you need Nakshaband. You need that kind of a technology. You need that kind of a loom. You need a graph to be made of the image that, the dia uh, that you want to get it onto the uh, cloth. You need the jala, the draw loom, that particular process, attachments that you want. You, those are necessary to create for that. So it is just appropriate for that. But if a person is just wearing a simple, sustainable, thick, coarse count, low count, coarse cloth of low count cotton, which you'll see him through for two, three years, you don't need a draw loom with Nakshabandi to do it. You just needed our, uh, you know, Jharkhand Tana loom to do it. So then what is appropriate? So we need to keep this particular aspect in mind. You have rugs like a dhabla that are made, a very simple, very basic loom, which does and it lasts. The item that is produced is lasts. You also have looms that produce very fine cotton with that particular raw material. That is appropriate for that. So this is something that we need to actually keep in mind when we are looking at it. What unfortunately has happened is, like I mentioned, uh, that in our senses, we were senses, we do not have any indication of the traditional looms that we have. Nowhere. This is something that we need to actually document and do, you know, understand it a lot more. So this is with looms. And uh, uh, what I have shown you today is only a fraction. To understand more, you can look at a wonderful book called Of Fiber and Loom by Lotika Varadrajan and Krishna Amin Patil. That gives you a great number of even more, you know, looms. Narrow, we all know of the gota, that you, zari gota that is put on skirts and dupattas and so on. There is a small loom that weaves that, a small loom. So our notion and a vision of a loom, the reason I'm focusing on loom is because in a certain sense it encapsulates, you know, what people think of textiles. So do you have some looms like that? You have for cots earlier, navar used to be made. Navar is strip of thick cotton cloth. And that was like charpai is woven with, uh, you know, a uh, rope of grass. Similarly, this tape of cloth uh, cotton cloth was woven across, was uh, woven and then it was strung across the cot. You have a small loom to do that. On the uh, edging of the firans of Kashmiri women, you have a small tape attachment that is woven separately. Similarly, you have kulu uh, shawls and you have kulu coats, you have small tapes, you know, that are made. They are all woven, those are twill tapestry made tapes and they're all woven separately on small looms. The range of looms across country and in each region is enormous. Look at the kind of science and technologies that, have ex that are existed and in the hands of people. 
This is something that we need to nada, to weave a nada, that is a drawstring that, uh, that you put in, uh, uh, you know, in salwars or churidars or even in lehengas. Again, that is woven on a simple loom, small loom. But look at its functionality. Look at the appropriateness of the science and technology. This is what I wanted to share with you so that you, you get a certain perspective and a way of looking at these textiles. Okay. Thank you very much.